Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Hunting and Network Telemetry, sponsored by Vectra. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Dale O'Grady, Principal Engineer at Vectra, and Chris Crowley, SANS Senior Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to end the webcast over to our presenters. Uh, great, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, appreciate uh, Dale that you're taking the time today to talk about this. Um, basically, I'm going to start off with a little bit about uh, what we're going to discuss today, and then we'll uh, we'll get into it and talk about some of the uh, some of the hunting. Um, so, the um, reason why uh, basically I wrote this in this form was there was a talk that I listened to in 2017. David J. Bianco wrote. Uh, many people know uh, David Bianco's writing. Um, his uh, his presentation that he gave at the SANS uh, Threat Hunting and Incident Response Summit, the THIR Summit in 2017, was titled uh, "Toppling the Stack: Outlier Detection for Threat Hunters." And the thing that I really liked about that is it was a set of sort of abstracted notions about how to do threat hunting. And it, it wasn't, um, you know, over the top in terms of abstraction. It's like, here's how I group things. Here's how I do this. And here's how this would be applied and how it would be useful. And so um, that plus my study of the various successful attacks right this is something that you know we uh, we want to our engineer things so that our systems alert hey alert 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 there's a problem you want to do it but we also need to be honest with ourselves that attackers are still putting stuff past us in our defenses and there are various reasons for that and that's that's the reality of uh, of life for us but so looking at those and studying how they can be effective and sometimes their effectiveness is being quiet and stealthy and subtle and other times their effectiveness is just being brutes and just pushing through defenses that, that are inadequate to actually stop them. So sort of informed by the reality of that, um, I, I'm going to present some techniques. Again, a little bit of an abstracted way um, those techniques will be presented. And then um, Dale will talk about ways which Vectra is actually implementing those in their in their technology in, in some of the cases. They're not going to have time to cover all of the cases, but they'll cover a, a couple of them. And so um, what this paper was intended to do, because this webcast is tied to a paper that um, that I wrote, what the paper was intended to do is basically say, okay, here's the here's the idea. And then here's one example instance of where you uh, where you apply it. And as I'm talking about these different ideas, I'm separating them out and I'm giving examples of one technique and then the next technique. But really, I'm doing that in order to be more efficient in the communication of the ideas. And and the thing that I have in mind is that you would build these capabilities into your repertoire of hunting, and then bundle them together in order to make the most effects, effective selection of the things which are potential anomalies. And there are times where the tool will just do it for you. And that's great, right? We love that. We love when the tool just does it. But I also want you to remain a human being and realize you're the adult in the room. You're the adult using the tool. And you still need to make sense of what that's doing and why it's doing it so that you can then make sense of that in light of all the other contextual information to come up with uh, this is bad or maybe it's not bad and I need to investigate it further, right? So that's that's the idea of hunting is, is we're looking for stuff in a somewhat unstructured way, um, but we still need ideas to start from for that. So the, the paper will be, um, will be shared, the link to the paper will be shared in the chat window of, you know, today at some point. Um, I'm sure Carol will, will do it toward the end of the uh, the webcast. So with that, let me start talking about some um, techniques uh, that uh, that are in use. And I'll, I'll mention the technique and then I'll talk about some examples and sort of um, you know how it works. I also will talk about maybe combining this with 
other things that are in place in this list of, of items. So the first one is high frequency of occurrence. And selecting a, a set of, or taking a set of data and selecting elements out of it, you can um, apply counting based on grouping and then look for things that are really common. Now, things that are really common might be okay, but they might also be indicative of not being okay. And so a top talker for DNS domains, um, for the queries which are going outbound, it might be that this is a normal thing that happens on your network, or it might also be that on you know the you know the 14th of March, um, you know we tend or the 15th of March, the Ides of March, as it were, right? Um, you know we tend to have you know a peak in uh, you know in in um, you know the the DNS queries for A2 Brute or you know some, something along those lines, where just like there's some sort of seasonal variation that on a certain day on a certain you know cycle of the month that all of a sudden those queries peak. Okay, well that peak might also look like a DNS command and control channel. And the idea of having all of a sudden something talking and making lots and lots of queries is one way to start to identify that there's a, that there's a problem, okay? So throughout all of these techniques, and as I'm talking about them, they're good ways to start, there are certainly going to be false positives, and that's part of the danger of hunting. Is you have to realize, look, I'm I'm looking at at data that there's no clear indication. It's my effort. One of the products of me looking at it is detection of things which are suspicious and warrant further investigation. And one of the techniques to do that is say there was so much of this that it just popped up to me and I saw it right. And so DNS, this is a this is a, a good one. Uh, to, to work at. And then there's the opposite end of the spectrum, which is least frequency of occurrence. And so a high frequency of occurrence um, gets lots of things. Least frequency of occurrence is the, this is distinctive and unique, right? And this is something that you can actually extract out of a large data set. And I'm just going to share a personal story uh, just because I think that it illustrates it even better than talking about, you know, a, a auto start extensibility points as a distinctive thing on a, you know, on a, on a host different than all of the other hosts of the same type is when I was in high school years ago, I used to go to like all the hockey games. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts and it was uh, a, a common sport to play was hockey. And I remember my mom said to me, you know, um, one weekend she said, Mrs. Mrs. Smith, not her real name, of course, Mrs. Smith said that you were at the hockey game last night and were standing up in the stands screaming at the other team. And, and I was like, well, yeah, I was mom. But it's not like I was the only person standing up <laughs> screaming. There was a crowd of people, and we were all screaming at the other team. We were all taunting the other team. But Mrs. Smith only saw me. Why? Because basically I was the only redhead <laughs> that was there <laughs> among this group of people. Like I stuck out as distinct and unique because I was a singular occurrence. And this is something that has, you know, benefited me and been to my detriment my entire life. This is something that adversaries oftentimes have to do in some way. They are doing something necessarily that is causing the system to do stuff that the rest of the systems aren't doing, <laughs> right? Unless they simultaneously compromised every single host in your network in the exact same fashion at the same time, you've got, you've got unique instances, which if you're looking in the right way, pop out, okay? And so the, the challenge with least frequency of occurrence is usually selecting an appropriate frame where something looks like it's distinct and unique, okay? This also is a big challenge if every single host in your environment is configured differently, okay? But if I don't have that, where most of the hosts are con configured the same way, I can basically take this 
outlier situation, which is this is the only host with this particular registry key associated with an auto start extensibility point. And then again, the combination with a couple of the, that are coming up, the idea of needlessly random, random or uncommon origins, and I'll cover what those are in a moment. So if you think least frequency of occurrence and needlessly random, also the high frequency of occurrence and needlessly random are pretty good indicators that you definitely need to continue to look at that stuff and pursue it as a, as a potentially problematic thing. So another thing that we can do to try to identify stuff that's of interest is a predictably automated action. This becomes even more meaningful and significant if it's a predictably automated action in a context where we expect human beings to be doing things. And so people are not entirely routine. A lot of people do the same sort of thing every day at about the same time, but it's not going to be 9000000 every single day, right? That's a computer that's doing that. If it's exactly at that tempo every single day, adjusting for, you know, NTP and time skew and all this other stuff, if it is precisely at the same time, it is with certainty, some sort of an automated routine coming off of an information system. Uh, an adversary can work to mask that behavior. They can introduce slight delays. You know, I, I've written little batch scripts for Windows to make um, you know my call out uh, happen. And I just have a, a basically on the loop, a series of numbers of like, wait this much time. <laughs> so so this all of these can be undermined by adversary behavior if they're trying to um, circumvent that. Let's make them circumvent everything though, right? If If we're hunting, they have to come up with ideas that actually don't get them detected across all of these different techniques. And so that's what we're looking for. Some sort of, uh, some sort of um, routine. Now, I, chaotic is actually a term that when we talk about chaos theory, there's some interesting things associated with it. Um, you can also look at human patterns over time. In, in some descriptors, there's sort of these... Um, these, no, these nodes of repetition or strange attractors where things tend to keep cycling back to that specific action. Um, and so you can, you can start to describe behaviors of people in terms of cycles and then look for things which aren't sloppy enough to, to, really, be, to really be human. And again, if I have my little script where I'm looking at a, an introduced delay over time, that introduced delay would repeat Precisely, right? And so um, this is something that that adversaries who are really good at operational security will be using randomized intervals for callouts. Um, and so that might not be how we uh, find them. Another thing that I want to think about in terms of technique for identifying uh, items of interest is novelty. And most of the time, when you when I'm presuming when you hear that word, novelty is like fun. This is good. This is cool. We want. Well, novelty in this context is the notion of the first time that something happens, which is usually something we associate with good and fun and 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 worthwhile. Only well, adversaries have to introduce that at some point, right? Unless they're already in your supply chain and they've already delivered uh, that stuff as part of the uh, operating system or firmware on an ongoing basis, there will be some first time of introduction Okay. And so this might be the first time that we interacted with that IP address, the first time that that host received an inbound request on a specific port, first time that we called out to that given domain. Um, the MAC address, which has never before been seen on a network segment, which isn't a public network segment. And even on the public network segment, the Wi-Fi network access that people are allowed to uh, get on and connect to the internet, even that actually has a, a value in terms of the novelty. Being able to trace back to the singular first instance is of value. Um, and we'll get into some more details of this, but the idea of the TLS certificates, since we're talking about um, you know, hunting and, and network information, 
uh, a lot of times people sort of like, okay, well, I give up because there's an, everything's encrypted now and I can't see it. Well, there's still stuff that you actually can look at. And the TLS certificate is, uh, <clears throat> is a value. And encrypted communications with, which start without a TLS, TLS handshake on your network is also potentially of, of interest for you to, uh, to hunt to things of, uh, of uh, interest for further pursuit in terms of looking for kind of initial intrusions. Right? Another thing that we have for this is the idea of extended persistence. Uh, you know, I have conversations with people all the time. Um, Usually after talking with somebody on, uh, you know, a chat on Hangouts or LinkedIn or WhatsApp or w whatever you're using, Signal, you know, the, the conversation kind of fades away, right? There's not this constant, s sustained conversation that happens. It's human behavior, right? Now, some people are a little pushier than others. Some people are a little more persistent than others, but long-term persistence is indicative of routine action or it's indicative of attackers having capability in your environment that they're leveraging. And, and we have consistently taken the stance as defenders that if it's been going on for a long time, then it must be okay. It's it's part of our workflow. It's part of our business IT operations. And there's an aspect of hunting that I don't think that people uh, really embody adequately. And that is to be skeptical of everything, right? don't just trust that because that is a transaction which has been done every month for the last you know 24 months don't just trust that this time it's okay some people don't like that idea they're like you're making me question all these things which we've already vetted and are trustworthy it's like yeah we're hunting now that's <laughs> that's what we do during our hunting effort Right during during our engineered use case, um, you know, alert driven stuff. That's when we eliminate all the stuff that we think that we already know. But during the the hunting aspect, that's when everything gets pulled pulled apart again and questioned with this with this skeptical notion and a repeated action over a long duration for almost all network defenders means trusted almost without any additional consideration or regard. And I suggest to you to consider the fact that attackers study us, right? Because they have to get by us. Now, we collectively have gotten a lot better in the last 10, 15 years. The, the first major worm that I worked in my cybersecurity career was Blaster. Right. This was pre, you know, Patch Tuesday kind of stuff where it like melted down our network. The switches our our indication that our network was thoroughly compromised by Blaster or Nachi or whichever it was, it doesn't really matter, was because the switches kept crashing. Like, why are all the switches crashing? Oh, it's because there's so much traffic, the switches can't keep up with it. Okay. That was how we learned about the fact that we were infected thoroughly compromised. So congratulations to us as the cybersecurity world that that stuff really doesn't happen much anymore. And I say that in light of the fact that was there was just a zero day um, you know, patch identified by Microsoft in the last couple of weeks. In spite of that, in a fairly organized and expeditious fashion, the word got out and the computer networks were not melting down because there was an unpatched flaw that was being actively exploited. Now, you might have had damage from that. If so, I'm really sorry. Um, but the reality is that we have gotten much, much better in terms of defense. We're still not good. Don't, don't fool yourself. We're still not really good. But we've gotten much better. And so when I look at SolarWinds 
and the introduction of a of of a um a, an, a compromise point through a supply chain attack on the one hand i admire the craft of the attacker on the other hand i admire what we collectively have done in the last 15 20 years to make it so that attackers have to do that right they have to go to the supply chain to get it introduced into our environments which means that we're making some pretty good progress because they just can't come to the front of the network and actually attack it anymore right in most cases right and when they can do that it is something which we're in a better position with our hunting to identify that okay if you remain skeptical and that's what i want you to do at certain times of the day in your hunting hour in the week whatever amount of time you have for it that's when you're not trusting anything attackers will also create random stuff and if we're looking for it and looking by way of comparison to a normal sort of usage we can find this okay so having truly unique host names is difficult for people to come up with today and so usually it's the sequence of multiple words put together. Even multiple words put together is, uh, is a challenge anymore for people to come up with good ones that actually make sense, okay? Um, and so the, this aspect of a domain name that people tend to use, it tends to be either a certain pattern that's pronounceable in the, the Western kind of languages, or it's just a bunch of garbage. Right, in terms of what what adversaries are doing, and they will do some um, you know lookalike type domains to try to avoid having to go to randomness. If they're doing lookalike domains, that's something that's uh, that's interesting, and I'll get to that in a moment. True nonconformance to a protocol. Okay, so the protocols which our networks speak have specific directions which uh, dictate this is what you will do. So TCP 443 is uh, commonly associated with HTTPS. The HTTPS protocol has a certain a way that it starts. And if, it, if a conversation on your network does not start in conformance with that standard negotiation, well, then it's non-conformant and you can actually identify it. Another thing that I've noticed uh, over time is that a lot, the SMB attacks, uh, which occur um, and have occurred for a, an extended uh, period of time, if you actually find the attack at some point inside of there, usually the parsers for SMB break. And it's just like, here's a huge blob of data that I don't really understand, right? That also is a form of protocol nonconformance that you can potentially uh, look for. And related, um, not strictly nonconformant, is protocol deviation. Now, this is something that's weird. And when you when you think about this uh, this idea of deviation in your hunting, this would be a conversation that you're having with a person on a normal basis, and they start introducing stuff into that conversation that just doesn't fit the normal flow of the conversation. Okay. And so we want to look for that in our uh, environments. And so a good example of this is that having multiple logon failures from one location for different accounts does not violate SMB. Right? That is authorized within the protocol. However, that's not usually the way that things work. Okay, so that sort of deviation is something that you can hunt for, of like this is what would be more normal, and then this is something that's just a little bit off. And people who um, do this a lot tend to get that spidey sense or whatever you want to say in terms of um, coming up with good inferences and um, having good uh, sense or trusting their gut or whatever term you use for it. That comes with time. I'd also warn you 
that it comes with a legacy of you jumping to conclusions that are incorrect. <laughs> so, so just be careful about that. But that's okay. You can trust your inference when your uh, your instinct when hunting. Just be aware of the fact that I'm even going to be skeptical of my own instincts in order to make sure that I'm not overlooking or missing things uh, by trusting that instinct. Uh, an aspect of this is um, addressing and geography and correlation back to geography based on uh, connections in network traffic. And so I'm not going to say that you know this this is guaranteed to to map back to that specific geographical location, but you can probably identify the majority of where your customers come from. And if you're a big global enterprise, you probably have regional affinity um, to different services locations across the world, right? So if you have uh, you know an Asia data center probably most of the Asia traffic is going to go to that APAC data center. So that sort of thing, you can you can look at stuff. Also, a lot of times you can start to think about double dipping in terms of the utility of this hunting effort. Call in your marketing department and say, hey, we're going to do this threat hunt. What we would be interested in is actually your opinion and take on some of the information that we have on the access to the public website. And we would like to share the data with you in a way that we just talk about what this data means. And you tell us from your perspective, how you make sense of what these customers coming to our public website are actually doing. And there will be some value for, for them in terms of reviewing that sort of log data you will also gain insight on their intuition and their instincts in terms of what's normal from what people do. And it might inform you in terms of being able to actually look at stuff. You might not be able to get to um, specifically to uh, a specific GOIP differentiation, but that might also be a very plausible technique for you in terms of hunting. Um, and similar to that is the idea of uncommon origins, um, weird routing stuff, um, RFC 1918 addresses attempting to come in um, from a, a, you know an otherwise internet routable, uh, but you had to allow that for some reason. Um, other sort of weird uh, sequencing things in the traffic. And so as an example, um, IP uh, option, of loose source routing. And, and there actually are a number of circumstances where IP loose source routing is actually still in use today, but it might not be normal in your network, internal to your network, and there might be something that's, uh, that's going on that's weird. And then any of your uh, network uh, advertisement type um, um, protocols might also be of interest uh, to look for strange things coming to you. And then there's the idea of mathematically improbable. Okay, um, my advanced mathematics are not very good. Uh, you know, I'm out of practice. I've got some some basic stuff in terms of what I can do in, in terms of my uh, mathematical repertoire. But as it turns out, computers are really good at doing math really fast. Uh, and having something where you can say, perform math on this, data set in order to look for something which is an outlier becomes really uh, valuable. So you might have a standard deviation, you might have a standard error. Um, there may be a, a way that you do linear regression in order to, uh, to look for things which do not conform to the line or the curve or not within a given field or a range of values or some sort of a, a plane. And you could if you had somebody who understood some data science type work, you could actually work with them and say, you know what, I'm not even going to tell you what this stuff means. I just want you to formulate outliers for me. You come up with ways that we can identify outliers. And this is where a lot of our techniques, I think, are going. It will be the combination of a, an effective mathematical scheme 
for distinguishing uh, um, outliers with the knowledge of subject matter expertise blended into that um, that sort of mathematical differentiation, which is leading us to the ideas of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and so this is uh, this is something that I really do foresee our um, socks moving toward support by very effective machine learning and artificial intelligence type algorithms uh, to um, begin to be able to address the true scale of what we have to look at in network traffic. And so uh, with that, um, basically the, the techniques that I discussed, you're probably doing them in some form. Uh, think about distinctions of them and then when you can use them in, uh, in unison. And also think about making sure everybody on your team really understands what each of these things are and how they work uh, for good hunting. So with that, I want to turn it over to Dale. All right, that is great. Thank you so much, Chris, for setting the stage on that. Uh, again, my name is Dale from uh, from Vectra, and what we're going to be doing next here is just going through some of the examples of you know where we apply some of those concepts that Chris has outlined here. Uh, but first, I do need to set the stage sharing just a little bit about Vectra, our approach to the problem space, and I will apologize in advance for going very fast through at least the first part, uh, but I bet you it's going to be appreciated because I'm sure not everyone here wants to sit through another vendor just security explaining everything to them. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start the uh, pre-frame. And in the pre-frame, we're starting with the zero trust network architecture. Uh, everywhere, everyone is somewhere along this journey. Uh, and of course, thanks to last year, you might be much further along this journey than you originally planned, but nonetheless, the fundamentals themselves don't change. It really it comes down to applying the principles of least privilege to the network. And to do that, you need to do certain things. And those fundamentals are, you know, obviously the ability to protect the endpoints, which the industry continues to get better at. We've gotten much, much better at over time. A um, lot of EDR vendors out there, you know, really making a difference, really helping protect the endpoints. Hardening access to the cloud and the data center, of course, has evolved significantly. Sure, we can take a lot of lessons learned over the past couple decades in perimeter-based security and apply that. That still does apply to a degree to, you know, to the new zero trust infrastructure, but also adding, you know, zero trust network access type technologies in order to further, you know, accept the fact that, you know, there is no longer a finite number of perimeters. There is an infinite number of perimeters now, and so least privilege is the best we can do. And then the third part, of course, being you know the ability, and I do not want to understate this in any stretch, the ability to detect and monitor at all times. And so in order to do this zero, tr zero trust networking properly, you need to factor down uh, all of those areas. So then the question comes in, well, why? If we're heading down this path of zero trust and least privilege, well, why are things still so bad? Why are there so many breaches? Why are they accelerating? Why are they hitting more folks than in the past would have just said, yeah, it'll never happen to me? And you know, the big question is the why. Well, you know, our, you know, we're fundamental believers that um, this false sense of security is one of the reasons that's you know causing this problem to to last and exacerbate for so long. Um, and what it does is it creates this security gap. So it's not enough to just state that you want to detect and monitor everything as per you know number three in the zero trust fundamentals. It's all in how you do it. And Chris covered a lot of those concepts here today because you know when we take a look back, um, yeah, we still need prevention technologies. No one's going to you know state otherwise. But what is abundantly clear, 100% prevention is not possible. A compromise is a fact of life, and compromise is no longer a four-letter word. Breach is still a four-letter word, but compromise is not. It's just a fact of life. And if we look at the other end of the spectrum, yeah, I just look in the news. We're just seeing, you know, more and more evidence of, you know, a lot of after the fact, hey, wow, this happened. Hey, at least we caught it this time. Back in the past, you know, it would have been happening and we would not have known. So things are certainly, you know, gone, you know, pretty much as far as they can on both ends. But we're still experiencing this massive influx in these in these breaches that are occurring. And so what Vector wants to do is we want to focus on that security gap in the middle. We want to use that to try to shrink it. And when you can try to shrink that by applying different techniques, manual hunting, automated hunting, and try to get ahead of it, that is when you're dealing with a world of when it's post-compromise, 
pre-breach. And that's really where we wanna spend our time focusing and closing. So here come the eye rolls. I can feel it right now, um, Vectra AI. Uh, and But stick with me for a moment, uh, trust me. You know, we are gonna go through some examples of manual hunting using telemetry. Um, but we're also going to cover some examples where automated hunting is needed to be successful. You know, there's not just one way to solve all problems. And so what at Vectra, what we want to do is we want to use AI to record usable telemetry for manual hunting. And usable is a keyword. It's not just about grabbing random data and hoping for the best. It's putting it into a way that you can actually consume it. One, consume it as a human, but two, consume it in a mechanism so that you can use AI to now automate some of that in order to augment the analyst. And that is really why you know, we wanna use AI to separate the signal from the noise because the noise is the enemy. We're talking a massive amount of information and you'll get a good feel for it if you haven't already, which I'm sure you have, as we go through some of the examples inside, uh, inside our hunt. So if we're looking at some of these uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, oops, my bad. I gotta head back one slide. At Vector, we subscribe to this theorem in that there's the no free lunch theorem. And really what we're trying to say there is that you need to select the best approach to solve the problem at hand. There's not one way of doing everything. Not one approach is gonna solve all problems. Um, and even though you find the best approach to solving a problem, that one will still have a cost. And that cost is you know, really that no free lunch. Just to give you an idea of a couple of different ways of doing this, um, you know, there are mechanisms where you might use supervised machine learning. These are areas where it makes sense to you know, train the environment in advance. The way command and control in essence works the same. The way protocols in essence work the same. It's not gonna work differently from one environment to another fundamentally. So you don't need that, what we call that, that local learning. But there are unsupervised areas where, yeah, your user works different than my user, or that application works different than my application. And that's where you're applying some level of unsupervised learning. You wanna learn those outliers, you wanna learn what the pattern is, and you wanna come out and identify some of those outliers. Deep learning is not a different one on its own per se, because it can be applied to these. And as a matter of fact, at Vectra, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a lot of what we'll call semi-supervised. So we're already overlaying overlays. And so taking something that you can try to define to a certain degree, incorporate some learning that goes on in real time, and then run that through deep learning. Now this is more of that continuous learning, you know, long short-term memory, whatever models you wanna call them, in order to be able to you know, dissect and interpret all of these different problems that are, that are you know, being exposed so that you can therefore consume them. Now, that is a lot of words. And in this case, I'm sorry, it's got a bit of a delay here. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, you know, certainly today, we don't have the time for them, but you know, I like to, you know, I once saw a meme that uh, it once said, you know, if it's written in PowerPoint, it's AI. If it's written in Python, it's ML. And, you know, so as an industry, we're gonna use these terms interchangeably all the time. But, you know, the best way is let's just sort of think of this as AI is defining the problem statement and ML is, the, is a mechanism to solve a particular, very specific problem. And this is just to give you an idea of, you know, this is just a handful of, you know, some of our 70 plus models where we use machine learning to help address individual problems. We tried to draw them out in a bit of a format to give you an idea of that no free lunch theorem. There's not one way to solve all problems. Some are very, very good at building baselines and finding anomalies. Others are much better suited to training in advance. But the moral of the story here is you can see most of them sort of fall into that middle in that security gap where we're actually trying to um, really close that security gap and get more of an early warning system or a pre-breach warning post-compromise. So I, I promise that's it for you know, the, the, the marketing type slides. What I'll do now is I'm just gonna go into a few examples. And to give you an example, um, just a couple things to preface this. Uh, this, a lot of the data that I'm using here, I didn't want to redact everything for you guys and have, you know, black screen all over the place because I'm hiding everything. I got one or two examples where I had to hide a few things, but most of it I tried to take from more of a lab environment. So to give you an idea of how to, how to utilize some of these and how to interpret them. Um, another thing to note to the audience is that there is this one network, uh, 10.254.20. 
Class C network, which is treated as an external network in this environment. So just try to keep that in the back of your mind as you see some of these examples that might look a little weird because um, it's RFC 1918 might look into in, but in that if it's that 20 dot network, it's actually into out communications. Now let's take a look at the first hunt. So in this case, you know what we're going to do is we're going to we want to combine some of these models. And so Chris talked about, you know, high frequency, dealing with the top talkers, conversely dealing with the, the low and slow or the, the low frequency, and then overlaying some automation, internal driven, human driven, computer driven, and trying to put those things together to take a very, very large problem and make it now manageable. So here I'm looking at some um, network telemetry, metadata, pick the term that you want to use. In this case, we're starting with DNS names. DNS names, very easy to get, you know, log DNS information. Here we're looking at high frequency. And in this case, we're looking at like top 20 type thing. You can get a very quick view into your environment. You know, as Chris was mentioning, okay, well, what's used all the time? Here are my top 20. It's easy, uh, nothing's easy, but it's, you know, it's relatively easy for me as a human to go through and determine, hey, should these exist in my environment? And do I approve them? Do I authorize those? I can start negating some of them, right? I do wanna check them periodically because things will change, right? Never trust forever. But I, I, I can go ahead and I can narrow some of those down. And then what that gives me is that gives me the next order of high frequency. So when your high frequency doesn't have to be your highest frequency. It's that next order of detail down where if you can get rid of some of this noise, now you're looking at that next level of high frequency. Conversely, if we look at the low frequency example, this is a very, very hard problem. That black blob in the bottom, these are all these unique queries, counts of one. Yeah, there's pages and pages. I'm looking at like 20,000 in such a small environment. And yeah, I could go through and start saying, I expect all these LDAP queries and stuff like that. But damn, that's page one. Well, what do I do for the other, you know, tens of thousands of pages? I can't go through that manually it becomes very problematic and what we end up getting here is a problem known as the long tail problem so high frequency great that's finite problem we can work it we can find out what's the next order of detail but that long tail where do i even start you know yeah i know how to interpret something that i look at but how do i know that i picked the right one to go looking for the way to start working the long tail is using that overlay and by using overlay, you can combine some of these concepts together. So now let's combine the concept of something that might be a little unique or might be not as you know, high a frequency with something that is presenting perhaps automated or non-human. And here we're looking at the raw beacon. Now, beacon, unlike DNS data, you don't just grab it from the switch or a log or something. There's nothing, no packet that just says, hey, I'm a beacon. This is something where, you know, in, in our case, in the vector world, our collector is using machine learning to determine if there is some sort of beacon present. And Chris touched upon this earlier. Yeah, the easy beacon is the pole that happens every five seconds, every five minutes, whatever, never changes. That's the easy one, but that's like every stock ticker that's out there, right? It's how do we deal with the ones that introduce jitter, introduce latency? I'm looking at some beacon types here that you know might be you know a single beacon, multiple responses or multiple sessions. What if I have you know, multiple sessions, multiple responses. What if I do multi-domain and I'm now splitting my beacon and adding jitter and adding latency, adding all of this stuff to the mix. So there's a lot that can go under the hood at the telemetry side to determine, okay, do I have something of interest? Now make no mistake, these are not detections. These are not alerts. This is just data saying, it looks like there might be a beacon that exists inside this data. And so now I can summarize even further. And so now I'm taking this massive problem, this huge funnel, and I'm funneling it down to, okay, I've got all these unique things happening. I've got some different frequency happening. I might have some mechanism occurring here that might be indicative of uh, automated or computer driven. And now I can get a listing and say, hey, wow, I've got this, you know, API.winscribe type thing. You know, that's kind of interesting. What is that? And then me just double clicking into this, I can see that there's this one host a dot 102, it's the only host consuming this. I've taken something that is massive and turned it into a manageable investigative problem. And that's by summarizing and overlaying. Um, that's one example. We'll go into the example of hunt number two, where we're dealing with novelty and first interactions. And man, this one's tough. 
This one's tough when it comes to a human, just because time series, time duration. Uh, it's really hard. You have no idea how much data you have. How do you go back and find when the first occurrence was? But it's important. So this is where you're better off letting the tool record it for you. Its memory can last forever. And you know you wanna know, it doesn't mean that these things are all malicious, but they can come into play and give you an example. What we're gonna do is we're gonna record them and they live forever. And we can go back and say, hey, look, this J Hook 73 host first appeared on the network February 18th, 2021. Um, there's other parts that are interesting as well. This D.O. Grady guy, guilty as charged, um, external connection, TCP port 81. So, you know, it's not just the, yeah, you can have a lot of port 80 connections, a lot of 443 connections. This one is kind of weird. It's worth recording. And it's worth, especially if you can start gathering all these things and looking at them together, looking at them in a larger scope, you can still do manual hunting inside of an automated process that has given you that telemetry and that data. And of course, it goes much further than that. You know, we we'll start talking about admin protocol usage, the first time SSH was used. So it's a lot more than just the first connection to an IP. And but the val the data can be extremely valuable as you consume it and as you use it as part of your hunting. So I, the moral of the story is not every hunt is going through a billion lines of log files, right? There are different ways that you can hunt with inside telemetry. So let's go on to hunt number three. So this one is the extended persistence model, uh, things that perhaps repeat long duration. And what we wanna do with this one is we wanna try to overlay and make the problem a little more finite by looking for things that generally, not always, but generally go hand in hand with them, you know, perhaps some protocol masking for obfuscation, um, or when Chris was going through and discussing protocol non-conformance, you know, how can we utilize those together to come down to a more meaningful problem? So here I'm looking at, you know, all kinds of data. Top left, there's like 1.8 million records here. Again, not event, not alerts, just raw data. We're looking at um, basically some in to out um, connections, and these are all sorted by duration. So duration there is in milliseconds. So the top line is the longest down to, and there's pages and pages and pages of this. Bottom line is the first N number of pages are all extremely long. And by going that through that, we can get an idea of what type of long sessions are we seeing. And then we can start screening some of them out. Now, when I'm screening them out, by looking at this first page, it's easy enough to do it manually, but how many pages do you go into where you're trying to figure out, okay, this one's still good. The time it would take would just be phenomenal. So what we wanna do is we wanna try to go ahead and we want to try to uh, refine that problem statement. So here, if we overlay non-conformance with it, we can get a little tighter. And you know, sure, I still have about 30,000 hits in this one, but you get the picture. I can start narrowing down and I can weed out another layer by taking it a big chunk. I can see a lot of UDP 443, encrypted 443, Google, Google API type stuff, and I can remove that. Um, but I can also see at a glance, I've got this long, long ICMP connection at the top. That is certainly strange. I've got these other connections to response domain is blank, meaning I'm going direct to an IP. So I haven't even resolved a name and those are long. Now, all of a sudden I've taken something that is massive. I've made it finite. And now I, as a human being can go and I can investigate these things by overlaying, you know, non-conformance by overlaying these other, you know, suspicious activity that comes inside and using, of course, your intuition and your logic, and I hate to say it, gut feeling the time, you know, to determine where am I gonna spend the best use of time? And so it's really, really important to try to frame that problem as best as you can. And that's on to hunt number four. In hunt number four, this is where let's go back and let's focus at the DNS data again. The long tail presents itself again. That long tail is such a problem, but that is where Typically, you go to almost every major you know, breach that has occurred. At some point, there's going to be something that presents itself in the long tail. So how do we get there? Knowing that I can't really do that as a human. This is one, sorry, it's redacted, but this is one where machine learning really, really needs to help you, you know, refine that list. And it's more than just one example. If we take the first record here, we're looking at something that is crazy weird looking, needlessly random is what you know, Chris was mentioning. 
that is needlessly random and long and crazy. And yeah, it pops out. Now, if I've got 20,000 pages, I may not even notice that. Even in my video, even in my description here, it's truncated because it's so long. So I might not notice things like that as a human, but a machine learning can pick stuff like that out pretty easily. The other aspect though, it gets more complex. Now, if we look at the middle example, it's what we'll call normal weird looking. And then Chris was talking about, you know, the romance languages and streaming things together, trying to make them look a little more normal. Well, how do you pick those out? If I can read them one at a time and concentrate, as a human, I probably can, but there's just too much data. So in this case, we're looking for machine learning techniques that can, and I don't know exactly what this does under the hood. There's no way of knowing, especially when you're using deep learning, but let's just, I'll just use a complete you know, hypothesis. Let's just pretend for the sake of argument, all the learning has learned that the characters VDI never proceed, you know, EO.com or never come after uh, you know, HZMK. There's something about it that has been learned over time that says, this is not right. Um, again, you know, this just means that somebody should probably take a look into it. And then the last one is the hardest one. This is normal looking. Unfortunately, I had to redact the actual name, but I can tell you right now, underneath that redacted block is a very, very short, normal looking domain that because of the same machine learning techniques that are used, is presenting as this isn't right. This is something that we need to look at. So all of these would present in some way or, or, or manner inside that long tail. And this gives you a better ability to go and synthesize that down to something that you can actually consume, investigate and action. Um, because Chris nailed it earlier on, you know, even AI machine learning, all of that, the human is still the last mile. The human is still the one that needs to make the final determination especially when you're dealing with the, the hunt and trying to draw your own conclusions. And the last example I'll go through today is one uh, around protocol deviation here. And this one can get pretty tough too, because this is where you're dealing with valid traffic, but unexpected use. Um, again, frequency levels always come into play. And here, there are so many different paths that you can take to it. So we're gonna start with what I'll call an, an, an initial sort. And in this initial sort, I've already tried to frame the problem a little bit more. I'm not just looking at everything under the sun. I'm interested in this area, NTLM, I'm interested in internal, in-to-in, -in account usage and authentication. And I can see it just so happens this first page is all, you know, C. Wilson 74, but I can see that there are some failures happening here. C. Wilson's supposed to be here. C. Wilson's supposed to be using NTLM. C. Wilson is presenting several usernames and C. Wilson is failing in some areas and failing authentication. So now what I can do is I can take that premise and I can further refine it. Go at one of my spider legs and go down and you know, some of these things are spider legs or rabbit holes and you start going down these different hunts and I can start looking at things. And I just, all I did there is sort of summarize that in the left is I can get an idea of I'm interested in, in to in, which is what we're showing here. I'm interested in authentication that's failing and I'm interested in Windows remote management, WinRM. You know, that is something that obviously is being used for lateral movement. It's ways that we manage machines inside. And I'm hoping and I'm praying that those list of origin host names, those are my internal devices and users. I'm hoping those are my administrators. I'm hoping that this is just a script where the password has been changed. And I'm hoping that this is not something where they're general users that perhaps, and let's go overlay all of our concepts back together. Is there a beacon? Is there other information presenting itself? And is somebody trying to use that machine as a pivot point to do lateral movement inside my environment? I've now again, once again, created a finite problem. Is my work done? No, not by any stretch, but at least it's actionable. I've got something I can do, something I can look at, and I can bring that problem down into a manageable state as a human being. So those are just like five really quick examples. You know, try it yourself, vector.ai slash demo. Uh, certainly happy to continue this conversation, scoping an intrusion using host and network indicators, uh, you know, on April 28th. And in that case, we can start stitching more of these individual concepts into a longer narrative and story. Uh, and I'll turn it back and hopefully I've left enough time for some questions and uh, thank you very much. All right, thanks for that great presentation. We do have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for our presenters, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first one asks, is there a way to mix this web contents with the contents of threat actor analysis and strategic 
security investments. It says weak signals, search analysis, maybe IOBs. And this is rather long. long. Would this help for me to uh, put this in the chat window for you? Go ahead, yeah, if you, can, if you can add that. Do you want to take that, uh, Chris, or do you want me to take that? Um, so I actually, I'll, I'll let you, I'll defer to you. You go ahead and answer it, and then I'll, I'll, I'll look at it afterwards. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and it, yeah. yeah, and this is, it's, it's not something that we covered a lot of today, but what uh, basically, you've got a couple different ways of doing that. And so in the past, what we used to do is we used to do just a ton of stuff based off of reputation. Um, you know, we try to use this global learning, we call it. And, you know, it can become uh, very problematic because there are just so many bad actors. There's lots of global information. So um, what I would recommend is going down this path of framing your hunt, looking for something of interest, getting it to a manageable level, and then pivoting at that point to this uh, threat actor analysis overview. And then now what you're doing is you're saying, OK, I've got a finite problem that I can now define are there evidence or are there is there evidence of this occurring in other places in other organizations and that's where you're doing you know your your your, your web threat analysis your other reputation analysis and trying to put it into a bit of a frame uh, i'm not sure if that's exactly what was be was asking uh, but uh, i hope uh, i hope i helped there yeah and let me let me add to it cuz i'm i'm going to approach it from a slightly different angle um, with the idea of uh, threat intelligence and you can either use these techniques that I'm talking about with threat intelligence that you're consuming, uh, which is there, there's an external thing that somebody just said, hey, we're seeing this stuff, this is this threat actor. You could go and study attributes of how this actor tends to behave based on, based on attributed uh, available information in the open source domain, or if you have some sort of additional domain of, of data that you can acquire through partners or information sharing communities or whatever. So you could use that to select, well, what does this threat actor sometimes do in your consumption of that? But also uh, a thing that you might be sort of moving toward uh, with this with this question would also be the idea of how do we then take these hunting behaviors that we're doing and stitch them into the threat intelligence production strategy mm -hmm. where when we go to share that information with other people we do that in in light of our, our threat intelligence aspect um and and so to me i think that it absolutely can be done but that would take a fairly mature security operation capability to to have that as a desirable work output um, and to be willing to exert the effort to actually add that additional aspect of, um, of a production aspect to the hunting effort. I, I've written a bunch of stuff around hunting and, and I talk about the, um, the work outputs. And I actually, based on this question, I'm kind of thinking, do I, do I encourage people enough to do threat intelligence production when an a successful outlier has actually been identified based on a certain uh, hunt technique. So that might be something that's a worthwhile artifact for people to, to reconsider, are we doing that? Because it's not only you know for your team that it would be valuable, it would be valuable to other teams and you could probably figure out a way to share that without having to do specific uh, notification of having been compromised which would then make it a bad day for that adversary because then they would need to, in some cases, change behaviors, um, which costs them stuff, which is part of our strategy for disrupting adversaries. Is If we disrupt them across enough, enough places, it becomes financially no longer viable for them to keep doing what they're doing, which is what we want. So uh, hopefully that addresses the the question because I'm I'm not 100% where they were going with it, but I, it's got I think between Dale's answer and my answer we're kind of in the in the right region uh, for it. So do we have time for another question, Carol, or is that it? I think that we're out of time. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> can I mention so. one? Can I just mention one sure. last thing yep. before you wrap Go things ahead. up? So I did want to clarify. There are two papers and there are two webcasts. This first webcast is related to the first paper that Carol provided the link to. And the first one was basically the idea of hunting 
the frame that we're using is how do you find an initial in, uh, an intrusion that you're not currently aware of? This is the sort of, here's where we get started. We're hunting for something that we didn't know about. The next, uh, the second paper, which is forthcoming, and the second webcast, uh, which is coming up on April 28th, is about now that we know that we have a problem, how do we then change our thinking and scope the problem or sweep the environment or whatever whatever term you use for that, how do we find everywhere that it's present? So these two papers are intended to go hand in hand with sort of the, the different techniques that we use, which have to be this sort of adaptable ad hoc hunting style. We don't really know what we're looking for, but we're looking anyway kind of stuff. So just wanted to, just wanted to conclude with that. All right, well, thank you so much, Chris and Dale, for your great presentation, and to Vectra for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.